God, that's our prayer today. Lord, your word declares that in the last days, the spirit of Antichrist, this beast system, would try to wear out the saints. And Lord, we know that means mentally, emotionally, spiritually, in every way. With all these crazy things going on, all this deception, all these different demonic, satanic things going on, all these evil people with their evil plots, Lord, uh, Help us to not get weighed down by that, but to trust you, to believe you, to believe your word, to know that you are with us, and greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We have power and authority in the name of Jesus, and by the blood of Jesus, and we just thank you, Father, that we have that power and authority. You've sent your angels to encamp round about us. And Lord, we just trust you're our refuge, our fortress, our healer, our deliverer, our savior, and our soon coming king. We ask you, Lord, to bless this service, to touch everyone here today, those watching and listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated this morning. We welcome everyone to Fire and Grace Church this morning, those watching and listening. For a minute there, it seems we... Looked like we weren't going to be able to broadcast, but we are now. I guess I shouldn't have said those that three-letter word the other night in the live stream of a certain intelligence agency, um, but I did, and the volume went out. So, um, for those of you watching, just want to say this: if you didn't see, um, people have been asking what I felt about all this—the coronavirus, the pandemic, hysteria, and, and everything. Um, if you want to see that, we did a three-hour live stream the other night on YouTube and Facebook, so you'll find your answers there. I'm not going to be talking about that today. Um, we are going to continue the series on biblical cosmology and creation. Believe it or not, it's been a long time since I've done a series this long. This is part eight. Part eight uh, I've entitled this The Racing Luminaries and the Stationary Earth. Um, this is really um, a perfect continuation from last week when I talked about the ether and what space really is. And, uh, of course, we had a science lesson last week about the, uh, the ether and about the ether being the medium for light waves and how that was the foundation of physics for 2,000 years until a fuzzy-headed guy named... Einstein decided to come up with a, an equation to get everybody away from that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today. So we do have another science class today, but we also have a Bible class we've got to get through today. So I uh, hope you have your Bibles. You need to open them today. This is, uh, again, very important that we understand God's creation. And uh, let me just tell you, if for those of you out there who say it doesn't matter, it sure matters to a lot of people because thousands and thousands and thousands of people are watching this series. It's blowing my mind. The first one is already over 10,000 views. So if that tells you anything, it, all, it, it definitely matters. It matters to Christians, and it matters even to non-Christians. It's leading many uh, to uh, faith in Jesus Christ, to salvation, because their faith and confidence in the accuracy and the inspiration, the divine inspiration of the scriptures has been restored. And so people now are believing the Bible who for years doubted the Bible and, uh, or re just rejected it outright because of so-called science and the heliocentric Copernican system that we're finding out is completely fabricated. I'm um, going to see some of that today. But anyway... Part 8, the racing luminaries and the stationary earth. What's stationary mean? It means it's not moving, right? Uh, we're going to look at what the Bible says. We're going to look at what science uh, proved. But uh, we're going to look at the Bible first. So this is um, our first scripture we're going to look at. This is Zechariah 1.11. Um, you can read the whole chapter if you like. But it says, They answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Now, I don't know how you get a spinning, orbiting, flying, hurling, 
ball through the endless vacuum of space out of this verse. But yet there's so many Christians who believe what uh, they've been told by scientists instead of what God's Word says. Can I just tell you, and let me just say this, we're going to get into this as we go, but um, I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. I believe what Jesus said when he said in Matthew 4, 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I believe when God inspired his holy prophets and apostles to write down that he inspired every word. Do you hear me? Every word. I don't believe for one second that they were giving their opinion or that God was giving them wrong information. Okay? And if any so-called Christian or pastor or minister says something that even hints toward, well, they just didn't know any better. They were just describing it from their human mind or their human perspective. The moment they do that, they are denying the divine inspiration of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, and they have already walked away. They're on dangerous, dangerous ground. All right? Um, but let's read this again. This is Zechariah 111. Behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Guess what happens when you look those words up? Still and at rest. Guess what it means? Still and at rest. Right? Not complicated, even in Hebrew. Uh, there you go. I like this. This is the word here. Um, yashab. Uh, it means to sit down. As in ambush, in quiet. Now, if you're going to sit down, what are you doing? You're ceasing movement, right? You're not traveling anywhere. You're not going anywhere. You're not spinning. You're not orbiting. You're not flying. You're sitting down. You're sitting still. In fact, you're sitting so, so still and quiet like as if you were trying to ambush someone, right? So you're trying to not be heard or seen or make any kind of movement. Oh, that's the word there for uh, still. Notice it says the other one, be at rest, to be quiet, to be undisturbed, inactive. Uh, Shalkot here means idleness. What does idleness mean? You're not doing anything, right? You're completely idle. And notice it says be still there, be still, rest. So we don't get from Scripture that the earth is moving. The earth is not moving. Here's some more Scriptures we get. First Chronicles 16.30. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Stable, not moved. That's pretty clear to me, right? Yet we got a spinning, spiraling orbiting, flying, right? These massive speeds. They even say it wobbles. Weebles, remember the weebles wobbles, but they don't fall down, right? No, I'm sorry. It's stable. It's still. It's at rest. This is what the Bible teaches. Now, I, I love it when these ministers, these preachers, or these YouTube people try to say, well, still doesn't mean still. Rest doesn't mean rest. Not moved doesn't mean not moved. This is what they do, right? Or they were just describing it as they perceived it. Oh, well, God forbid, too, that we should describe anything as we see it, right? <laughs> but uh, this is the inspired word of God about the earth, about the world that we live in, that he made for us. It's still and it rests. It's stable and not moved. Uh, Psalm 93, 1. Let's read that. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established, that it cannot be moved. Somebody say, cannot, cannot. be moved. Gravity is not moving it. The gravity of the sun is not moving the earth. 
It cannot be moved. Right? And by the way, when God created the heavens and the earth on the first day, and he created the sun on the fourth day, what was the earth orbiting and flying and spinning and moving around? Nothing. See, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. We've believed a lie. It's an elaborate lie. It's an amazing lie. But it's a lie. God's word is clear. I can't wait to hear some of these YouTube preachers start saying, cannot be moved does not mean cannot be moved. Um, Psalm 104, 1 through 5. I want to read it from the Amplified Version, but it's still good in the King James. But I just wanted to read it here. Listen to this. This is, this is his uh, biblical cosmology passage as you can get here. Um, bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. You are the one who covers yourself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a tent curtain. The heavens he's talking about is the firmament. Who lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters above the firmament. And that's in the Amplified. That's not me saying that. And then he says, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his ministers. Here we go. He established the earth on its foundations so that it will not be moved forever and ever. <laughs> Here we go. I mean, and you know we could do this for a while. But God established the earth upon its foundations that it what? So that it will not be moved forever and ever. Somebody say the Bible teaches. Say it with me. The Bible teaches the earth does not move. This is what the Bible teaches. Now modern science tells you it does. Whose report will you believe, Christian? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Hmm, we shall see. Joshua 10. So today we're talking about the, the luminaries. Now, I'm going to say this. The earth doesn't move, but the sun and the moon and the stars, they move. And that's what is taught. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's what, as Christians, we should believe. It is also what we observe. But let's read this. this before I came to this understanding, when I was still deceived by the world's heliocentric Copernican Big Bang system, um, this passage as a Christian troubled me more than any other. Because I believed in the divine inspiration of Scripture. I believed every word was important. I believed every word proceeded from the Holy Spirit of God to men. I believed it was the truth, but I could not. I would read this and I would go, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, I don't understand this, right? But let's read this. Joshua 10, 11 through 14. It says here, and it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and we're in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekah, and they died, and they were more which died of the hailstones than whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and moon, thou moon, in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, or stopped. Until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies, is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, let's look at this. Not only does it say, you could say, well, Joshua just said sun stand still, moon stand still, right? You could just say, well, Joshua, that just came out of his mouth. He didn't know what he's talking about. Well, this is what modern theologians do. 
But then the scripture is going to say, so the sun stood still. Huh, I wonder if that means stood still in Hebrew. Yeah, I checked it, it does. In the midst of heaven, in the middle of heaven, and he's talking about in our open heaven here, the first heaven. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And hasted not to go down a whole day, right? Now, let's look at this a little closer, right? So here's a map of Israel in that time period. And there's Gibeon, where they were, fighting the Amorites. And there... The sun stood still over Gibeon. Now notice that this is a map facing north, south, east, and west. So to my to the left there is directly west. Directly west, the moon is over the valley of Ajalon. Well, get this. That is exactly how it should be. See, in the biblical model of the earth, the flat earth model of the earth, the sun and the moon are moving east to west, but in a circular path. And sometimes they do kind of catch up with each other, so sometimes they're kind of close to each other. But this would be correct. Now, if the moon was down here, say, over Jerusalem, we might have a problem. But it's in direct line east to west. And I noticed this at my, at my house. Uh, I know exactly where the sun comes up. And goes over and goes down, and the moon follows it at night. I can watch it go the same path. So there again, here's another map. You see where Jerusalem is. There's Gibeon. There's Ajalon. There's your sun. Stop. Moon. Stand still. There it is. Now, this is what the Bible said happened. And guess what? I believe it happened just like this. But it's telling us something that the sun and the moon are moving, not the earth, right? There's no way you get around this. There's no way you dance around this. There's no way unless you just say they just didn't know, God didn't tell them, and basically you're saying that this, this passage of Scripture is not inspired by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit gave incorrect information. It didn't tell them that God actually made the earth stop spinning. And then, well, he had had to make the earth stop spinning and the moon stop orbiting, right, if it's the heliocentric. But he was, you know, of course, the guy Joshua who spent time with Moses, who was on the mountain, who was in the glory. Now, he couldn't know better. He couldn't know anything. He's just stupid, right? This is what, this is what your preachers are telling folks, all right? Now, of course, I had a megachurch pastor get real mad at me a few years ago about this. Really, really, really mad. Um, and sent me a nasty email. And his whole thing was, well, you're, you're, you're not, it says the sun went down in that passage, right? And I was like, do you, do you, do you megachurch pastors, that's what I ask him, do you all ever look up anything in Hebrew or Greek? Because obviously you don't know what you're talking about. So I sent it back to him. I sent back to him the definition of the word from Hebrew that's translated in our English Bibles, go down, and uh, even sent him screenshots from the Blue Letter Bible. Um, but, oh, let me back up. But go down in this passage. If you notice, the King James translated come 1,435 times, all right? Bring 487 times, in 233 times, enter 125 times, go 123 times, carry uh, 17 times. It, it translates it down 23 times, all right? But I want to show you that the definition of the word, and it's bow, B-O-W, that's the way we would write it, but bow uh, never never translated go down. It means to go, go in, enter. Basically, it's like walking in a door. It, mean, it just simply means to go or come. Um, like you would walk in the door of a house and walk out the back door. You go. It's not, it's not talking about up and down. Okay? Does everybody get that clear? In fact, you can look up like this is the Strong's. Here's the Jensenius 
Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, look what it says. To come in, to enter. The place which anyone enters as a house, a city, a country, a ship. So you, you walk in. It just simply means to come and to go. To walk in the door, to walk back out the door. To walk through that door and walk, turn, and walk through that door. Not up or down. It, matter of fact, if you go through the whole, Jensenius gets really deep into it. To enter into the house. To go out. To come in. I mean, it just keeps going. And uh, it's basically just telling you the sun is coming and going. It's not going up or going down. Now, what is it? Why does the sun appear to go up and down in our vision? Well, it's just a perspective thing, right? Because our vision, we have a point where it appears to be going up. It's the same thing we see when we see an airplane. An airplane's flying, say an airplane's coming at you and it's flying, you, you're, you're looking at it, say, to the east, and it's flying at 40,000 feet. The airplane never changes altitude, but as it approaches you, it appears to be going up, and as it gets overhead, it's here, and then as it goes away from you, it appears to be going down. It never changes altitude, not one time. It is a perspective matter because everything, we have a line of convergence with our vision, and it's limited. So when we see this up and down, it's the same thing. I've been driving, I was driving to Florida one time to the beach or to the Gulf Shores, and I remember this layer of clouds. We were going down the road, and this layer of clouds, probably about 20,000 feet. And I remember that I was looking at them, and they just, you know, I was kind of up on a hill, and it gets real flat as you're driving down to the beach, and you could just see those clouds for miles and miles. But the clouds that were ahead of me for several miles, what? And here, let's see, and this is it. This is showing you what your vision sees, the perspective versus the, the actual path of the sun. It, the sun never is changing altitude there. It's just, it's just moving. It's coming and going. But I remember these clouds, they looked like they were going down and disappearing into the road. Well, guess what? When I would get to that crest of the road, the clouds were still, what, 20,000 feet, right? And this guy here, he's showing some good stuff about how, I mean, we can see that the sun is moving and though it appears to be going down, it's not really going down. It's just moving away, and it's getting further and further away. And, and notice, look, if the sun was 93 million miles away, it would not get smaller. That wouldn't, you know, just a few miles wouldn't make a big difference in 93 million miles. But this is what we witness here. And I could spend a lot of time on that. I want to show you this other one, but these are some... A camera above the clouds versus a camera on the ground. That sun is moving. Now they want to tell you the earth's spinning. The Bible tells you the sun is moving and the earth is still and at rest. And this is some cool stuff. He actually shows some really, really good footage here. And you can actually tell that sun is getting closer to where that camera is. So there's several miles up there. So just so you see it there. Now, this is just a rudimentary, of course, animation of kind of how it works. There's a little bit more detail to it than this, but just to give some of our new folks an idea. I love how they have the stars there embedded in the dome or attached in some way. And you see how the sun and the moon move over in a circular path over the earth. This is what the Bible teaches, period. And this, I believe, is, act, is reality. Uh, this is what we witness. Wait till I show you the astronaut pen that admits this in just a second here. But just so, because there's some people that don't even have a concept of what we're talking about, right? But that just gives you a little idea there, all right? Now, let's, let's read. Again, here's what the Bible says about it. Now, this is in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, the Holy Spirit revealed that the sun moves in a circuit like a man running a race. Who knows what a circuit is? Circuit is a? 
circular path. Right? All right, let's read it. This is Psalm 19, 4 through 6. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun. That's the tent. I believe that's the firmament dome. The tent, the tabernacle over the world. He set that tabernacle, and the sun is in that tabernacle. All right? Which is as or like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Now, let me ask you something. If space, if heaven is space, if that's what he's talking about, and there's endless, ever-expanding space, like we've been told. How in the world does the sun go from one end of the heaven to the other, especially if there's not an end to it? And how does the sun, our sun, go from one end to the other every day? See, again, to deny biblical cosmology, biblical creation, the way God describes it, so you can accept the Copernican heliocentric NASA lies, you have to say, well, this is just wrong. The Bible's just wrong. You have to say that. And that's what they say. All right? Let's uh, make sure we understand that circuit means a circular course or path. The Hebrew word for circuit in Psalms 19.6 is, yeah, I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Kufa, well, uh, whatever. <laughs> its definition in the Strong's Greek Dictionary states that, uh, or in the, I should have meant, I meant to say the Hebrew Dictionary, a revolution that is of the sun, course of time lapse circuit come about. Dictionary.com defines revolution as a moving in a circular or curving course about or around a central point. So the Bible says that the sun moves in a circuit, a circle, a circular path. And here Ecclesiastes, let's read this, verse 5, Ecclesiastes 1.5, The sun also arises, which is the same word, arise, go down, these are the words, bow, mean come, go. So the sun comes and goes and hasteth to his place where he arose, meaning the sun ends up right back where it started every day. Okay? Now, in the heliocentric model, they're telling us that not only are we spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, not only are we orbiting the earth at 66,000 miles an hour, not only are we we're traveling through... You know, we're spinning around the Milky Way galaxy at, uh, what is it, 400,000, 500,000 miles an hour, something like that. But that our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is itself also traveling through space at, you know, millions and millions of miles an hour. So let me ask you something. How would the sun, if we're, if we're doing all this moving through this vast universe, and the universe is expanding, and we're, we're one of those galaxies that are expanding and moving with it. How would the sun ever return to the place where it was before? How would it make a circuit and end up back where it started? This is not the model. The world's model is not. There's no way you reconcile the Copernican model, the heliocentric model, with the Bible. There's no way. Can't do it. It's impossible. You have to deny something. Okay? Or you have to ignore it. Um, and I cover this thoroughly. I have an entire chapter in my book. I was going to read some of it. But the circular path of the near sun covers all this, right? And in much more detail. Now, did y'all get to, were you able to turn that up at all? Um, this cat here, I'm going to deal with him specifically, uh, but this is, uh, I guess, a former pastor, or he's, I don't know if he's a pastor or a former pastor. 
Uh, okay, and he uses Logo software. But this is this is Mike Winger who just made. He's supposed to be a pastor or a former pastor, and he just made a video against biblical cosmology, biblical creation, flat Earth, aka flat Earth, uh, and uh, he called me out specifically. So I'm going to deal with him in more detail when I get time. It's been I, I've been too busy, but I want you to hear what he says about Psalm 19. He actually says the flat Earth the flat Earth model. The biblical cosmology model says the sun moves in a circuit. And Psalm 19 appears to sound that way, but it's really not. I mean, it's really a disaster. This is a train wreck. Let's listen to him. Let's see if we can hear it. Um, okay, so on, on the view, on the flat earth view, if you're with me here, so you're still flat earth, just hear me out, okay? You don't need to change your mind so far. Just listen to me. I'm just doing a Bible study with you. Um, on their view, the sun doesn't actually go to the edge of the earth because the ends of the earth are those edges. The sun sort of circles around like a third, a third of the way into the earth. It just circles around there. That would be sort of the idea, right? But the biblical teaching is that the sun seems to, at least from our perspective, go around us, not, you know, not do that kind of flat earth circuit. And so Psalm 19.6 seems to indicate this. It says, its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So it's, it's r rising, at least from our perspective, I think this is phenomenal, phenomenological language, or this is just how it appears to humans. He's not trying to describe the uh, scientific exactness of the functions of the universe. But it's described as, as coming up from that location way on the edge. But the, on the flat Earth models, the sun never is way over there. right? On the flat Earth models, the sun never touches the edge of the Earth. It doesn't work. This is not a biblical model. It's not giving respect to the, to the scriptures. It's just not. Now, let me tell you what's not giving respect to the scriptures. You notice he said there, phenomenological language. All right? Let's see what the definition of that means. And he, and he said, that's the language that the Bible's not tra trying to give you the scientific accuracy of how creation works. This is where they have to do. All right, because you have to deny it because Psalm 19 says the sun moves in a circle. So here you got a preacher saying, no, it doesn't. And it's not giving honor to the scriptures, but somehow his heliocentric. Copernican. Hermeticism view. Gives glory to the scriptures when the scriptures don't teach it at all. What a hypocrite. I mean, really, we're looking at a deceived man, all right? No, he's not giving honor to the scriptures. He's giving honor to the secular system. That's what he honors, all right? Don't call me out, buddy. I will expose you for the fraud you are because you don't believe the Bible. You believe man over the Bible. Phenomenological language. Here's uh, one of these Reformed Calvinist ministries telling you what it means because they have to do all this. Because Calvin started this, actually. John Calvin, the murderer. Uh, much of the Bible comes to us, it says, with language that describes the way things appear to the naked eye. The language used is descriptive of the way things look from our perspective and is not necessarily asserting precise scientific fact. An example of this is the description of the sun rising. Unless we understand the use of phenomenological language, we might think that the Bible teaches that the earth is at the center of the universe. Oh, God forbid that we should believe the Bible. What the Bible teaches, just plainly spoken. No, no, no. We got to say they just they were just describing it the way they thought. It's not really inspired by God. So they're not, they were, it's not scientifically correct. And it goes, it goes on to say, says, we see that the Bible is not really saying that the sun revolves around the earth. Yes, it is. It's really saying that. But this is what they do. No, even though it says that, it's not really saying that. Oh. And then, and then he, they even go on to this anthropomorphic or anthropomorphic language. And what's amazing about this one is they say, 
oh, it's wrong you know, that God has human characteristics like the finger of God. Like they're saying God doesn't have a finger, and yet it says we are created in the image of God, and we have fingers. But that's not right either. And I'm going to tell you, anybody following these guys, it's time to stop being the blind, following the blind. Amen? Now let's look at something. The Bible says that God set the sun and the moon in the firmament in Genesis, right? Now this is just a few weeks ago, March 4, 2020, Joshua Nowicki, photography, time lapse of the sun going down with Chicago skyline that you shouldn't see if the earth's a ball at all. But I want to show you something. This is amazing because you're going to see the sun going down or away in front of the clouds. Oh, I thought it was 93 million miles away. No. And this guy's not a flat earther. Look at this. Y'all see that? It's amazing. I'm going to play it again. Let's back up. Play. Oh, it's not going to do it? Back up twice. Boom. There we go. Thank you. But there's many more examples of this. The clouds behind the sun, which shouldn't be. Many more examples, like this one. And I've had people say, oh, the top one's just washed out. Well, why is not the middle one or the bottom one washed out? No. Sorry, people. The Bible talks about it in the book of Job. that Men don't see the sun that's in the clouds. They just can't see it. They just can't accept it. There it is. It's not outside. It's inside. There you go. There's so many of these. This is our friend Robert Forsh. Where is he, South Carolina? He's South Carolina. Um, he does this all the time. I think the man lives at the beach. I wonder if he even goes home. He just sleeps in his car, gets up, starts filming the sunrise and sunset. He's just hanging out at the beach. But there you go. Now, you can clearly see the cloud in front of the sun, and you can clearly see the clouds behind it. Crystal clear. And, I mean, we could do this. We could do this right here, video after video after video, photograph after photograph, negative after negative, you, you could just show this so many different ways, but I'm sorry, it's, you're too late, all right? Now, for some reason, let's see if this video is working now. It's not working. All right, let's go back here. Anyway, this is an interesting little experiment somebody did with a little glass dome or over a little cutout of a Flat Earth Gleason map, but they begin to show how the light can work. Now, I want to say this. The sun, we don't know what it is. We don't know exactly how it works, but it could be the fact that God is actually shining a light through the dome and creating a focal point that creates the sun, all right? I don't know how he does it, but this right here is interesting because they have the light outside the dome causing a focal point inside and causing the part light, part dark. But what's very interesting, and this is why the Russians in the, in the 1940s were doing studies on the brightness, they said, of the firmament over a flat earth. <laughs> they said because they were trying to figure out how light worked through the firmament. And notice how the light is over here and lighting this side. But on this side, you see light, bright. This would explain also if there is. No one's ever proved it to me that there's 24-hour sunlight in Antarctica. But it could very well be from this type of reflection off the dome and the way sun works through 
the glass, molten glass firmament and the ether. But let me just tell you something. The 24-hour light issue in, the, in Antarctica does not disprove the biblical model. Not at all, because no one really knows how all this is working. Not even the heliocentric Copernican model. Tell us the sun's a perfect uh, nuclear reaction going on, perfectly maintained. How do they know that? Have they been there? No, they don't know. They make up crap is what they did, right? And everybody goes, ooh, you have a white coat and a pen and a, and a chalk, you know, and a clipboard, so you must be smart. They just make it this stuff they, they, they have no way of knowing. Um, but let's keep going here. Now, I did, I found some more government documents. I went to the CIA website, to the Freedom of Information Act reading room, started doing searches, typing in stuff like stationary earth. And you know, you guys, I've done several messages on government documents. Well, I keep finding new ones, right? Now, these, were, these are documents that were classified, top secret. You talk about them, you reproduce them, you go to prison. You hear me? This is, this stuff was top secret. Now, this is a translated Russian document, actually, that we stole from them. But I want you to notice something. It's talking about lunar solar disturbances and the motion of artificial Earth satellites. But then it says down here that they are trying to work out this problem. And it says, it is assumed that the sun moves along a circle near the center of a planet satellite system of masses. The sun moves in a circle. Wait a minute, I thought the sun was there and we're moving in a circle. I just thought, found that interesting. The sun moves in a circle. Let's see this. Now let's, let's get into this. Let's get into the earth standing still and the experiment that proved it. Now, this is an article. Some of this is taken from an article from... Uh, what's his name? Sun, Sun Genis. I can't remember his first name. What's his first name? Uh, Robert Sun Genis. He is a geocentrist. He's not a flat earther, but he is a geocentrist. Um, claims to be a Christian too, but he he did great research. I checked out his sources on this, but this is what he says. Of course, um, this is his article, Albert Einstein, the Earth Mover: How Einstein Made the Earth Move When All the Experiments Showed That It Didn't Move. All right, and here's what it says. In his 1881 and 1887 experiments, Albert Michelson discovered the Earth was not moving around the sun. As Michelson himself described the results of his own experiment, quote, this conclusion directly contradicts the explanation which presupposes that the Earth moves. So he's saying, my experiment, which was accepted by all physicists at the time as legitimate He's saying it proved the earth wasn't moving, but we know it is just because we believe. We have a belief system, right? But the experiment said it wasn't. But since his colleagues, including Albert Einstein, were diehard Copernicans who didn't want to believe that Michelson had discovered a motionless earth, they proposed his experimental apparatus was distorted by the earth's motion through space and thus Michael's Michelson's apparatus only made it appear as if it wasn't moving. In scientific parlance, we call this, uh, I don't know, petitio principia or whatever. That is using a proof of a moving earth, the very thing one is trying to prove a moving earth. And then he goes on to talk about you can't do that, right? Now, Michelson, let's look at the Michelson-Morley experiment so we understand what happened here. Um, Michelson found the Earth wasn't moving by using the speed of two light beams against one another. Um, the first light beam was pointed westward because it was pr presumed the direction of the Earth's movement around the sun. The second light beam was pointed northward and thus away from the direction of the presumed moving Earth. The first light beam should have been affected by the Earth's movement through space if the Earth is moving around the sun at the accepted speed of 66,000 miles per hour. If so, the first beam would have traveled slower than the second light beam, but that didn't happen, right? 
Both light beams traveled at nearly the same speed. According to Michelson, the first beam traveled only about one-sixth of the retarded speed needed if the Earth was moving around the sun. So he did detect this one-sixth movement. We'll talk about that, but really what that is is the movement of the ether. But he found that basically, and what they said was, one-sixth basically says, it ain't moving the speed we say it's moving. Right? So they couldn't accept that. Um, and you can go into details. But this is what some of the physicists of the time said. Now think about this. These guys were in full meltdown panic mode. But this is what they said. This one right here. And I've checked these quotes. They're legit. Uh, it says uh, physicist Arthur Eddington there was just one alternative. The Earth's true velocity through space might happen to have been nil. That means nothing. Zip. Not moving. Uh, physicist Bernard Jaff or Hoffe, I don't know how you say that. I guess it's French. I don't know. The data of Michelson Morley were almost unbelievable. There was only one other possible conclusion to draw. The Earth was at rest. These are scientists. Saying this is the result of this experiment. Uh, physicist Adolf Baker, thus failure of Michelson Morley to observe different speeds of light at different times of the year suggested that the Earth might be at rest. It was therefore the preferred frame for measuring absolute motion in space. Yet we have known since Galileo that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Why should it be at rest in space? See, again, they're trying to still hold on to their system to their belief system about a heliocentric Copernican universe, but the experiment they knew was legit and proved it wrong, but they just couldn't let go. Why? Because that's their God. Uh, physicist James Coleman, the easiest explanation was the Earth was fixed in the ether and that everything else in the universe moved with respect to the Earth and the ether. Such an idea was not considered seriously since it would mean, in effect, that our Earth occupied the omnipotent position in the universe with all other heavenly bodies paying homage by moving around it. Oh, my. And the way God said it was, the way God created it, we can't accept that. But that's what we discovered. Let's keep going. Here's another one. I actually started reading this book yesterday. Um, it's in archives, but uh, this book right here is, um, I think it was in 1950 or so, but uh, historian uh, Lincoln Barnett, uh, who the book's forwarded by Albert Einstein, so it's not against the theory, his theory of relativity. Um, he's definitely uh, still a Copernican, but did say this. The Michelson-Morley experiment confronted scientists with an embarrassing alternative. On the one hand, they could scrap the ether theory, which had explained so many things about electricity, magnetism, and light. So we've got to throw out everything we know to be true about magnetism and light and electricity and, and how the ether explains all that. Or, if they insisted on retaining the ether, they had to abandon the still more vulnerable Copernican theory that the Earth is in motion. To many physicists, it seemed almost easier to believe that the Earth stood still than that waves, light waves, electromagnetic waves, could exist without a medium to sustain them. It was a serious dilemma and one that split scientific thought for a quarter century. Many new hypotheses were advanced and rejected and the experiment was tried again by Morley and others and the, with the same conclusion. The apparent velocity of the Earth through the ether was zero. Zero. More experiments were done for years. And guess what? They repeated experiments. Different physicists kept getting the same result. The Earth is not moving. So then comes along Mr. Einstein and comes up with his, and that's the book I got this out of. I was reading it yesterday, and that's where it says, the, there's the quote. So I'm letting you, just letting you see. I checked these out just to make sure 
Uh, here's some more physicists. Um, Michelson Morley found shifts in the interference fringes, but uh, they were very much smaller than the size of the effect expected from the known orbital motion of the Earth. Um, it's just funny to read uh, to read what these guys said here. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna try to get through this. It says, look at this, but it says, but the diehard Copernicans of that day were not about to accept the results of Michelson's experiment. So they weren't going to accept it even though they knew it was right. So residual easement. Incidentally, we, we should note one more important facet of the Michelson experiment before we move on. We saw above that the experiment showed only one-sixth of what was required for an Earth moving around the sun. This one six is important for another reason. It showed that space was composed of something substantive. Uh, the name given to it by Lorentz Maxwell and all the other scientists were, was ether. No one knew precisely what it was composed of, but they correctly deducted that space cannot be nothing since metaphysically nothing cannot exist. You know, <laughs> space must be a something composed of something physical Although, like air, we cannot see it because it is invisible. It doesn't matter what you call it. The fact is that it must exist. Quantum mechanics has suggested that the ether's basic component is Planck particles, which are 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the electron. Another type of ether may be the uh, electron-positron dipole particle, which was discovered in 1932 by Carl Anderson. So basically what he's saying is the fact that they detected one-sixth of something moving was the ether itself, all right? So I'm gonna go on through this, just so you know, that why is this important? Well, it's important because, again, if the ether does exist, then the earth is not moving. That's what the experiment proved. But let me tell you, they, you look this up. You watch video after video, you can pull up science uh, lectures from colleges talking about the Michelson-Morley experiment. Here's what they're going to say over and over and over and over. They're going to say the Michelson-Morley experiment proved that the ether didn't exist. Did not. That is a lie. And some of them may not know they're lying. They just heard it from somebody else and it just keeps getting repeated. But it's a lie. Because the fact is that experiment after experiment detected at 1.16th of, of movement, one-tenth, and they figured out that that was the ether. And then, of course, last week I addressed that because so many, so many physicists now and scientists that are, are being honest about how light works and magnetism and electricity, they're saying, yeah, there's, there's an ether. And there's different experiments you can even do to prove it, okay? Um, but anyway, Einstein, they tried to deny, too, that this was the motivation for Einstein to come up with an equation to explain, basically to try to explain this experiment away, all right? And so, anyway, um, the Michelson-Morley uh, physicist Charles Lane Poor, Columbia University, said the Michelson-Morley experiment forms the basis of the relativity theory. Einstein calls it decisive. If it should develop that there is a measurable ether drift, then the entire fabric of relativity theory would collapse like a house of cards. So Einstein's saying if there's any detection whatsoever of the ether, then his whole theory of relativity falls apart like a house of cards. He admitted that. He knew it. A lot of them knew it. But to tell the truth would mean they'd have to accept the Bible was true, that the earth was still in at rest. And if you admit that, right, then all your atheists and agnostics and God-haters and deniers would have nothing left to cling to. So they continued it. Of course, uh, I looked all this up. I'm going to bypass some of this. But you get, you, if you... Uh, you can find this article, Electromagnetism, to talk about that. Um, yep. Einstein said here, soon I came to the conclusion that our uh, idea about the motion of the Earth with respect to the ether is incorrect. If we admit Michelson's null result as a fact, 
this was the first path which led me to the special theory of relativity. So he's saying, because the Earth wasn't moving, we got to get. I got to figure out a way, an equation to get rid of the ether, that where things will still work without ether. And that's what it was all about. And that's why Tesla said that these uh, mathematicians make these equations that have no basis in reality. That's what Tesla said about Einstein's equation. Now, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna speed through this, but I looked up this stuff to confirm. This is translation of the lecture where he did this, where he said the reason I did all this was because of the experiment. Of course, I started reading this book too, The Evolution of Physics. This is by Einstein and Leopold Enfeld. Um, it's very interesting right here what he says. And this, this I want to point out, because Einstein does admit that basically, whether you're looking at the biblical flat earth model of the earth still, the sun and moon moving, or you're looking at the Copernican system of the earth spinning and orbiting the sun, he said it's really just, it works both ways in, in sense of perspective. You basically get choose because there's certain mechanics at work. But listen to what he says. He says, can we can formulate physical laws so that they are valid for all um, coordinate points is what he's talking about there. Not only those moving uniformly, but also those moving quite arbitrarily relative to each other. If this can be done, our difficulties will be over. We shall then be able to apply the laws of nature to any coordinate system. The struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus, remember, geocentric, everything spinning around the, uh, you know, moving over the earth, or Copernicus, the earth moving around the sun, he said, would be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. What are you saying? You can basically have a working system the both ways. It can appear both ways. So he admits, you choose how you look at it. Boom. Everybody still with me? Now here's an interesting document I found. It's the CIA.gov. Freedom of Information Act reading room, another government document that we stole from them and translated. Notice this. It's talking about the, the title of this paper was the determination of gravity by a gravimeter at sea. And so they're, the basic, they're talking about the basic difficulty in determinations at sea lies in the motion of the gravimeter support, blah, blah, blah. It says two systems of coordinates are used. The first absolute. So the first absolute system coordinate we're using to do this study is what? Relative to a stationary Earth. Why? You say, remember somebody said, accuse me of cherry picking. Quotes from this? But Jordan reminded me the other day of something I said in one of those messages where I said, well, why are there cherries on an orange tree? Why in anything, if the earth is not stationary, would you presuppose that it is in any kind of study or research or scientific paper or trying to get some readings with scientific instruments? Why would you ever go, we're going to base this on a stationary earth if it's not stationary? And why would you say this is absolute? Oh, it just goes on and on. Here's something, too. Another Russian author. A few words in defense of the stationary Earth hypothesis. Why would a Russian scientist be defending the issue of the Earth being stationary? Hmm? In 1960? Somebody explain that to me. 
in a few words. And I mean, did they not, when he stood up and gave his defense of a stationary earth, just locked him up and put him in a crazy house in a mental institution? No. And for some reason, this document was classified, top secret. Can't talk about this. You go to prison. Now, here's one that's really interesting. This is made an intelligence report about Soviet st strategic forces for a peripheral strike on the United States, for a missile strike against the United States. Director of Intelligence, top secret, 1971. And this tells you a little bit about it here. This is introduction, the Soviet capability to carry out a strategic strikes against targets around the periphery of the USSR it is provided by elements of long-range aviation, the strategic rocket forces, and the Soviet Navy. And so this is what this is all about. They're, they're missiles, they're land-based missiles, they're ICBMs. And this is a top-secret report, Director of Intelligence of the United States of America, 19. 1971, right? This gives you the, boy, they went into great detail about all the Soviet capabilities to strike the United States. I went through this entire document. But let me show you something interesting that right here appears when it breaks down the different Soviet missiles, right? Giving a report. Remember, this is an intelligence report going to be given to the President of the United States. What does it say here? Going down the different missiles, it says, the Soviets have been testing a modified version of the SS-11, which may have a range of about 6,000 nautical miles, non-rotating Earth. What? Did the guys in the white suits and the, would come with the st straight jacket for the guy that wrote this report? Non-rotating Earth. You're talking about a 6,000-mile range ICBM to strike the United States, and you make a note, non-rotating Earth. Yeah. Of course, this is the... NASA document 1207, I've talked about many times, but again, what does it say? Derivation definition of linear aircraft model, NASA publication, right here. This report documents the derivation definition of linear aircraft model of a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Non-rotating. We could do this all day long. Flat, non-rotating Earth. Same document, the conclusion. Guess what? Flat, non-rotating Earth. Here's another one that we talked about a while back. Singular arc time, optimal climb trajectory of aircraft in a two-dimensional wind field. Um, written by NASA Ames Research Center. All right. Let's keep going here. What does it say here? In our minimum time to climb problem, the aircraft is modeled as a point mass. Flight trajectory is strictly confined in a vertical plane on a non-rotating flat Earth. Still, and it rests, they could say it that way. Immovable Earth. Stationary on its foundation Earth. It's not rotating. It's not spinning. It's not orbiting. Why is this in any technical manual, or top secret document, that it's non-rotating Earth. Here's this one. NASA tech Technical Memorandum. What was this one from? March 1972. Determination of angles of attack, side slip uh, from radar data, the roll stabilized platform, Langley, NASA Langley Research Center Technical Memorandum. This method is limited, however, to application where a flat, non-rotating Earth may be assumed. <laughs> oh, man. 
They ever take you to court and say you're crazy? They're saying that it's a flat, non-rotating earth? You just need to print these documents out and take them with you. You won't even need a lawyer. Here we go. This method is limited. Flat, non-rotating earth may be assumed. Method, however, is limited to applications where a flat, non-rotating earth may be assumed. Can you say you're cherry picking? Yeah, but it's an orange tree. Shouldn't be any cherries on it. These cherries shouldn't be on here. Um, here it says radar. It's talking about radar. It's assumed herein that the earth is represented as a flat, non-rotating reference frame. <laughs> the earth fixed system. You know what that means, don't you? It ain't moving. It's stable, established. It's fixed. Here's the calculation of wind compensation for launching of unguided rockets. NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, April 1961. Technical note. There you have it. I got this off of NASA.gov. What do we find here? This is a method for calculating wind compensation for unguided missiles. It's derived has a greater degree of flexibility than previously proposed methods. So they're talking about wind compensation, launch angles, and stuff for unguided rockets. Pretty important to know about the spin of the Earth and the spherical nature of the Earth, right? It, that'd all be important. Wrong. <laughs> the trajectory simulation incorporating the above requirements is presented in reference eight in addition to the above requirements, this simulation assumes a vehicle with six degrees of freedom and aerodynamic symmetry in roll and the missile position in space. Everybody say the missile position in space is computed relative to a flat, <laughs> non-rotating Earth. <laughs> a missile in space. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Here's a funny one. Here's a Russian conference. A Russian conference, this was classified, um, but a Russian conference on problems in the mathematical theory of motion of artificial celestial bodies. So this fellow down here it talks about the different presenters of this conference, and this guy down here, uh, Yarovoy, or whatever, gave a paper on his analytical relation between the coordinates of a rocket and time, which include factors due to the non-sphericity of the Earth. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm just amazed. And then, of course, they talk about they're taking into account the non-sphericity of the moon itself. Oh. I mean, the moon's done a ball? Hmm, we'll get to that in a second. Now, this is, uh, I just took this out of my book on the chapter about the moon here, but look, we're told that the moon's rotation or spin, and we're talking about, remember, because we're talking about the, the luminaries, the movement of luminaries. So we talked about the sun. We talked about now we've seen Russian documents, NASA documents, government documents, technical manuals, non-rotating Earth. Stuff's not moving, so it's not moving. So we've talked about the not moving Earth. We've talked about the sun. It's moving. We're talking a little bit about the moon. Now, this is what they tell us about the moon. So we're told that the moon's rotation or spin is only 10.3 miles per hour and that it doesn't have any real atmosphere, like they claim happens on Earth, to drag anything along as it spins. Nevertheless, in their desperation to seal their deception with the fake moon landings, they showed us videos of astronauts jumping on the moon's surface. Now, if you do the math, 10.3 miles an hour, the moon's supposed to be spinning. That's what they tell us. 10.3 miles an hour with no atmosphere. Okay? So, or they'll say, oh, it has trace amounts. Of yeah, well, that, your little gas or whatever you're trying to say is supposed to be in the vacuum of space because you've got to try to make up stuff as you go because you're getting busted left and right. But still, no atmosphere like we have. Because, of course, they claim our atmosphere drags everything around except airplanes. I don't know. But anyway, he says, if you do the math, 10.3 miles an hour comes to 15.1 feet per second. Now, I figured this myself. I made sure I did the math myself and checked it myself. So 
with virtually no atmosphere, apart from trace amounts of some gases that they claim, uh, to pull the astronauts along with the moon so they could land in the same spot. Now, they should have landed 15.1 feet away when the astronaut did the moon hop. So this astronaut, John uh, Young, jumps up in the air, does a salute, lands right back in the same spot. The flag doesn't move out of the frame. I'm going to show you the video. And um, he does it twice. This is Apollo 16. So he actually should have been about 30 feet away after he jumped twice. If the moon is spinning 15 miles an hour, see, one, and you count it. He jumps in there, one. One second, should be 15 feet away, right? Didn't happen. Um, here we go. Watch him. I'm sure there was no delay on this recording flag. either. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. Look at this. That's a pretty outstanding picture here, I tell you. Come on a little bit closer. Okay, here we go, a big one. Off the ground, a few more. There we go. I guess the earth, uh, the moon's still in at rest too. Because they're on the earth. I like to see an Air Force salute, Charlie, but I don't think they salute the Air Force. Sir, we do. <laughs> and fly high and straight and land soft. Okay, Charlie, they win. Here we go. All right. Again. For you. So, you saw that. So, the earth's not spinning yet. Let's look at this. So, here's some of the. Um, some of the reasons, you know, that people people get all bent out of shape because, of course, the moon does some weird things. Now, I, I don't know if we know what the moon is exactly. I think it may be plasma. It may be some kind of electrical thing that's uh, sometimes partially transparent. It's just a bizarre, it's just a bizarre thing. But this guy's a flat earth. Please explain the massive orientation shift between the two times. He says ellipsoid planet physics are correct. Oh, really? He says, both images taken at the same location and orientation is altered. So, image taken February the 9th, 2020 at 10 p.m., the image taken the next day, and they're saying from the same location, but there seems to be this rotation of the moon. Well, we just found out. We just saw the astronauts jumping on the moon, and the moon wasn't rotating, was it? But this picture shows the moon is rotated, right? Or appears to be rotated, but after one day, meaning it's been moving, so it's moved, just remember that, and now uh, one day of movement, 24 hours or whatever it was of movement, and yet it has rotated. So wait a minute, are the astronauts, is the moon rotators, does it not rotate? Well, according to what they showed us, it wasn't rotating. They tell us it is. These pictures make it appear that it is. But what's really going on? All right? Here's uh, another, the moon tilt. Right, so this is a picture from the same location, 5 p.m., right? You see, in fact, you can see blue sky through it. So it's, it's some, the moon is weird. It's semi-transparent plasma electric manifestation. But here it is at 5 p.m. See the, the dot up at the top, the dark spot. The dark spot now is more rotated to the right. 8 p.m., a little more by 11 p.m. So there's this rotation as the moon is moving. It appears the moon face is rotating. I've viewed this myself. All right, now, here's another big thing for the people who still want to focus on the globe and say we live on a ball. Say, well, when you're in the northern hemisphere, the moon ha appears to have this orientation. And when you're in the southern hemisphere, it is basically upside down. Um, you see the so-called Tycho, alleged Tycho crater here. In the northern hemisphere, it's up top. So they say that just means because you're on top of the ball looking at it and the bottom of the ball. And then, of course, flat earthers have really said, well, they've almost said, well, it's just because you're looking in different directions. But that, that doesn't really explain it because they try to make it out to be like it's a flat disk laying this way. And I don't believe it is. But I think the Lord finally showed me what's going on here. 
and why it appears this way. All right, now I want you to listen. This is our introduction to astronomy with Jason Kendall. Uh, he uh, talked about, I had him a clip last week, but he's going to talk about something called Faraday rotation. Discovered, I, I think it's interesting too that this was discovered by a Christian, all right, many years ago. He's pretty much the father of understanding magnetism and light and how it works. But let's listen to this, make sure we got the volume up good for this one. They need to hear this one. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're continuing on our mission to understand the full meaning of what light actually is. And so we left off last time with the advent of the, of the wave theory of light being dominant in all in modern physics and 19th century physics. Well, the next step in this whole thing is to actually really determine how the wave propagates. So, and also linking things. We're going to find that there's some amazing things that occur as we, go, as we look. So, in 1831, a great experimentalist by the name of Michael Faraday, who was also at the London Royal Society, he discovered through lots and lots of experiments, he was just a real tinkerer. And so, as he tinkered with things, he found that if he took a magnet and he moved it across a wire, it creates a current. And so this is called an induction. So it's in uh, electric field, and an electric field was induced by the magnet. So Michael Faraday uh, said, wow, if I take a current, if I take a loop of wire and put a voltmeter on it, which can measure the uh, voltage that's going, and you pass a magnet across, and the voltmeter uh, swings. That means that there's some sort of electromotive force, that's what he devised, they called it. So the electromotive force actually caused a current. So we could actually create a current by simply moving a magnet near a wire. And a wire is a conductor, meaning it allows electricity to go through it. So this is an experimentally derived thing. And the behavior now is going to need to, he, he doesn't have an exact definition for it, but yet now we, he's getting an idea of how things work. So this is interesting that it was discovered that if you take a magnet and pass it across a conductor, like a wire in a loop, you get, uh, you get a current, you get an electric current, you can get a shock from that. All right, so he then, he, but uh, the funny thing is, is that Michael Faraday himself was no mathematician. He regarded himself not even as that. It was something that was very difficult for him. But yet, and he, uh, and, but yet he, was, he had an incredible way of actually visualizing things. Um, the next thing he did is he went along in about 1845, about 14 years later, he then discovered that with polarized light, now firmly established as a concept, so if you take polarized light and apply a strong magnet to it, the light can be rotated by the polar, by the magnet. So light can be rotated in the presence of a magnet. So Michael Faraday is saying, well, there's, there's just got to be this enormous connection between electric fields and magnetic fields and light. There must be some kind of connection because look at this. I can rotate a polarized beam of light by applying a magnet to it. It's called Faraday rotation. It was discovered in 1845. So we have this uh, astronomy teacher, college, explaining to you Faraday rotation or the Faraday effect that basically and although all polarized light means is that basically they were able he focused a light through a glass tube so he got a straight beam of light and then as he passed the magnet over that glass tube he caused the light to rotate or twist okay well folks the earth is a magnet all right Faraday rotation Optical rotation of a beam of polarized light due to the Faraday effect. A rotation of a beam of polarized microwaves transversing an isotropic medium along the lines of force of a magnetic field. Just so you get it, polarized light is just ordinary light, but it's been focused. That's all that means. So here it is. Again, you take light, source of light, you run it through this tube to focus the beam so you can see what this particular beam of light does. You pass a magnet over it and it rotates the light. It twists it. Wasn't that what we're seeing with the moon? As it's moving across the earth, over the earth, the earth has different, different parts of the earth have different magnetic fields. 
And as it's passing over different magnetic fields, what are we seeing from the moon into our eyes? We're seeing light waves coming to our eyes. That's, why, that's how we see everything. It's light waves coming to our eyes from the moon. Well, if it's passing over a magnet and it itself is light, and what did Jesus say? The moon will, the moon has her own light. So the light we're seeing as it passes over different magnetic fields is we're seeing that light begin to what? Rotate. That's why when the so astronauts, so-called, if they were on the moon jumping and the moon's not rotating, well, first of all, we know they weren't on the moon. They were lying. But they had nothing to stand on anyway. Okay? But this is why the moon is rotating. It's simply the light bending as it's coming back to your eyes across magnetic fields. You understand? Is this... Pastor Dean making this up, or is this true science? Remember he said this was an experimentally proven thing again and again and again and again. This is a law of light and magnetism. Light rotates, twists, turns. Well, what you see is the light. All right? And this explains it all. Faraday effect, Faraday rotation. Uh, the Faraday effect or Faraday rotation is a magneto-optical phenomenon. Uh, the interaction of light and a magnetic field in a medium. What is the medium we discovered? The ether. All right? But let me ask you something. Do you believe there's a magnetic difference between the north, even on, on, on our flat plane, there's a difference in the magnetic field of the north versus the south. This is common knowledge, right? So, you see this? I, I pulled up the magnetic, uh, it talks about the physical interpretation. Circularly polarized light, the direction of the electric field rotates at the frequency of, of light, either clockwise or counterclockwise. You see that? Depending on the magnet, depending on where you place it, you can rotate the light clockwise or counterclockwise. Huh, is there something that rotates clockwise and counterclockwise? Yes, the stars. That's another big sticking point that people try to, and this is a magnet, this is just a disc. I pulled up disc magnet, and this is to show you the magnetic field on a magnet that's a disc. Do you see the difference between the center of the magnet, which would be the center of the flat biblical plane of the earth is the North Pole, and your, ma and your compasses point there. And then as you move away, and about here would be the equator, right? You get into a different magnetic field, all right? Now, I'm no expert on this stuff, but it seems pretty simple to me, right? I can tell, we, we know we move from one man magnetic field to another, right? And north and south, like the north and south ends of a magnet, they're opposite one another, right? Simple, basic things of playing with magnets when we were kids. Notice how intense it gets the further you go to the edge or to the south would be on our map. So... We have this thing, well, the reason the stars go the opposite way when you're in the southern hemisphere looking at them rotate versus the way they rotate in the northern hemisphere, that proves we live on a ball. No, it doesn't. You know what it proves? It proves Faraday rotation. That's what it proves. So I believe, again, what are stars? What are we seeing when we see the stars? We're seeing the light from the stars, right? But I believe once we move into the southern hemisphere and we're looking south, we're seeing that light coming to our eyes in a different magnetic field, and it's rotating it opposite 
of what it does in the north. And to me, that explains it. Because I know we don't live on a ball. And I know we don't live on a spinning ball. So how do you explain this? And reflection, I've, I've heard reflection, but reflection, there's different star constellations in the south, so it's not like it's a reflection of the, of the stars in the north. So what I see is we're looking at different magnetic fields. It's how our eyes see this happening because the magnetic field is rotating it opposite because we're at different ends of the magnet called Earth. So take it for what it's worth. I'm sure the debunkers and attackers and everything else will have fun with this. But, you know, here's the thing. They get upset with us if we don't give them a scientific explanation. And then when we do, then they still get upset. Right? <laughs> but this is what I believe. This is the answer to me of why the moon appears upside down in the southern hemisphere, lack of a better term, versus uh, the north, and why the star trails appear to go in opposite directions, clockwise and counterclockwise. And I just think it's simple, light waves, electromagnetism, different magnetic fields, and you're getting Faraday rotation of the moon and of the stars. And that's what we're perceiving it to be. That's, what we, that's the way our eyes see this light. It's being turned in different directions due to Faraday rotation, Faraday effect. That's what we're seeing. Somebody say amen or oh me. Now let me show you this. Um, this is the astronaut pen. I happened to come across a video because an acquaintance of ours just became an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I happened to see his graduation ceremony, and it said they were being pinned with an astronaut pin. I said, what in the world's astronaut pin? Well, I pulled it up. There's the astronaut pin. This thing goes back to the Mercury, right? This is what you get when you go through the astronaut training, and they, even though you hadn't gone anywhere yet, um, you get this astronaut pin. What does that look like to you? That looks like, to me, it doesn't look like a ball of any kind. It looks like a flat disc with Polaris at the top, at the center. And that there is an above the earth and a below the earth. Does that look like a flat earth with a Polaris at the top to you, or is it just me? That looks like the flat earth model. Well, why is that, I wonder? Because they know what it's, they know the truth. I mean, some of them do. Some of them don't. But look at that. They put the, the astronaut pin right in your face. Flat earth, flat disk, with a star at the center top. <sighs> All right. Did y'all learn anything today? Is the earth moving? Did scientists prove the earth was not moving? Michael and Morley proved the earth was not moving. They also proved the ether exists, right? Faraday, Christian scientist, proved what? He proved that light can be rotated by different magnetic fields. See, guess what? God's really given us the explanation of everything. You really have to choose, you know, to be stubborn. Because what the heliocentric Copernican system is, it's a belief system, it's religion. They put the sun at the center, it's hermeticism. Copernicus said he got the idea of the sun being at the center from the writings of hermeticism. Hermeticism is a cultism that's into sun worship. It was a religion, it started as a religion and the occultists and the Nazis and the Freemason occultists took it and they made sure that all of you believe it instead of believing the Bible. That's what it was all about. And it was to turn people away 
Now listen, I have stuff, I have more, so much more stuff, so many more, I could show you more scriptures, more videos, more footage of the sun, the moon. I mean, we could do this all day long. But let me just say, the luminaries, the sun, the moon, the stars, they are the ones moving. We're not moving. The earth's not moving. The ones, the higher-ups, they know this. That's why they say they have to write these technical manuals, how stuff works. That's why Russian scientists and American scientists that are high up writing these manuals that are top secret, it's a non-rotating flat earth. Now, folks, you know, I've, like with the government documents, I've covered this stuff. There's a reason they were top secret. They didn't want you to know what they knew. It's that simple. But you say, well, why, Pastor Dean, did they come out with the Freedom of Information Act? I'll tell you why. God made them do it. Because Jesus said, that everything spoken in secret, done in secret, would be what? Shouted from the rooftops. He basically told them, you got to confess. you got to put it out for the public to see. And they had to obey him. It's that simple. So, folks, here's the truth. And see, this is what, this is what scares people. God's word is true, very accurate, very correct, very detailed about creation and the sun, moon, and stars and how they work and where they are. Very detailed. So that tells us that this book was not just written by men, that God inspired every word supernaturally. He breathed it into them, and they wrote as the Holy Spirit of God moved upon them. So listen, if you can believe the Bible about Genesis 1, you can believe it about John chapter 3 where Jesus said you must be born again or you will not see the kingdom of God. You can believe it when it says there's a heaven and there's a hell. That sin is the problem. And that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that there is only one way to be forgiven, to be cleansed of your sin and that is to believe in the blood, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sin and my sin. You have to believe that with all your heart and that he rose from the dead the third day. And you have to be willing to say, God, forgive me for my sins. I have been a sinner and I need your forgiveness and I need you to cleanse me and wash me and make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's what I need. And that's all true, too. See, if you can't believe Genesis, you can't believe John 3. If you can't believe Genesis, you can't believe Matthew 24. If you can't believe Genesis, you can't believe Revelation. You hear me? You can't believe Romans. But God has raised this truth up at this time because scientism false science the lies the deception that's in the scientific world has led so many people astray and god has revived this truth and brought forth this evidence to set people free from the deception from the unbelief so that they can trust that we have a book from god from the creator that is true from the beginning of it to the end of it. And listen, he even confirmed it, not, not just with this creation truth, but he has confirmed it with fulfilled prophecies. The fulfilled prophecies of Jesus' first coming and now many fulfilled prophecies already warning us that we are nearing the end of the age, the great tribulation, and his second coming. And if you are wicked and rebellious and evil and want to live in sin, you're going to find yourself on the side of Satan and the Antichrist. 
But if you are, will, will repent of your sin and your unbelief and believe God's word and turn to Jesus Christ, God who came in the flesh to die for your sins and who rose from the dead, if you'll believe in him and repent and follow him, you will be saved and you will be on his side when he returns. That's why this is important. That's why I have a whole chapter in this book called Atheists Come to Jesus. One testimony after another. That's why I'm doing a series on this. Because it is important that we can know, that we can trust every word of Scripture to be literally true. Say, well, Pastor Dean, the Bible says Jesus is the door. Do you think he's a door with a doorknob? Oh, please don't be an idiot. That's just somebody trying to be a smart aleck. No, but when it says he's a door, what does that mean real clearly? He's the entrance. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way. You try to climb up some other way, you're a thief and a robber. You got to go through the door. He's the door. Oh, so you do believe in some figurative language. Yeah, I do. But creation is not figurative. There's a real earth and a real sun and a real moon and real stars and a real firmament and real dirt and real water. And it's the way God said it. Amen? All right. Let's stand. Let's do that song before we leave. I know I know we're a little, I went a little long, but I, I'm shorter than last week. <laughs> um, why am I remember? Um, every word. Which one? What is it? I'm listening. All right, let's do that one. We're going to worship the Lord, and then we're going to get out of here. Everyone stay safe. Um, we're going to pray for Mike before we get out of here. But let's worship with this song. Going to pray for Mike. If anybody else needs prayer, come on up. We love y'all. God bless.